Chief Upper Representative uh, Hayes and Gutenberg from, 19, uh, from 2001 to 2004. Yes. Also, uh, you wrote this to me. <laughs> <laughs> Committee aid to Alaska State Center Education Committee for Senator uh, Kevin Myers, uh, 2010. Committee aid to the House Fisheries Committee under Representative Steve Thompson, Joe Miller, Director of Alaska National Line Port Authority, 2005-2007, and Energy and Mining Project Manager for Fairbanks Economic Development from 2007 to 2010. And 2011 to 2016, he's a graduate of the graduate of the University of Alaska Fairbanks with a degree in political science. So, Jomo, welcome, and the floor is yours. Well, thank you, uh, boss, former boss. Uh, so, yes, I'm Jomo Stewart. I'm the general manager of the Interior Gas Utility here to give everyone an update regarding uh, the Interior Energy Project. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Um, if I may make a, a couple of uh, recognitions, sir. Sure. I have a couple of my members, it appears. Uh, Jack Wilbur there in the far, uh, in the back. Uh, he brought his beard. Um, as well as Patrice Lee, our newest board member. And of course, we have our intrepid uh, project manager, Mr. David Prusak. So if you have any technical questions, particularly regarding the storage, uh, when we get to that section, uh, David will be our man. So I'm here. Okay. So uh, knowing what the, uh, well, I did see the ad in the news. Paper, or not the ad, the op-ed in the newspaper, so not knowing um, what the content of the audience would be, it would be mostly familiar faces who are, are pretty surprised of the project. Uh, if we have a bunch of new faces, I did actually make two versions of this presentation. Uh, so if anybody would like the, the long-form version uh, that kind of walks a bit, goes a bit more in depth uh, into uh, some of the background of the project, uh, FEDC does have it. You can request it. Otherwise, I'm using the, uh, the skinnier version that really focuses more on uh, current activities and next steps. So I was here. Well, here, let's, let's start with the project goals. It's always nice to start with the project goals. And actually, if we look behind Mr. Wells, uh, you'll see the project goals um, that were originally defined uh, right here around this board table, actually, back in, uh, wow, well, way back, uh, 2010 timeframe. Yes. This is the Interior Energy Project, uh, as defined by the community, uh, are to bring low-cost energy to as many residents and businesses as possible uh, as, as quickly as possible, both to stabilize our economy, uh, to help uh, for a mechanism to, uh, for the improvement of air quality. So not necessarily to clean up the air, but to provide, again, one more tool in the toolbox to help us clean up our air. High project definition. Uh, really, what we're talking about is the transition of an energy economy, uh, attempting to do a rapid transition of an energy economy from one base fuel to another, from wood fuel and uh, wood, as it has been increasing in use, to natural gas. And so really what we're talking about is, uh, well, we're building upon a nascent system. FNG has been in operation for almost 20 years. Uh, FNG Pentex, uh, their system is an LNG-based system. They create LNG in the Cook Inlet region, truck it up to Fairbanks, put in storage and distribute Distribute it to a little over a thousand customers. Uh, really, the idea was to build upon that existing proven system, expand its benefits by increasing LNG production capacity, increasing LNG delivery capacity, increasing LNG storage capacity, and then of course increasing natural gas delivery capacity and helping folks convert to the use of that natural gas as best as possible. The time I was here it was in the run-up to decision regarding uh, really release of funds and moving the project forward in earnest in the form of uh, using some of those state appropriated funds, uh, of which there were about 340, 50 million uh, to both purchase Pentex, the existing operating natural gas uh, production and distribution uh, system, and company, as well as to uh, find the broader development of the IEP. So over 2017, uh, we moved from had been an MOU, an agreement to try to seek more definitive agreement uh, through the process of negotiation uh, to, to, to effectuate, again, the purchase of Pentex and funding of the IEP. And it came down really in the form of two major documents, what's called the Purchase and Sale Agreement and the Financing Agreement. 
Again, we negotiated over the entire span, almost the entire span of 2017, culminating uh, in uh, agreed documents, which were brought before the public. Uh, I'm doing presentations a little bit early. The major terms of the financing and uh, purchase sale agreement Agreements, which we'll go through, uh, actually got defined under the MOU. It's really just working out the details, but details matter, you know, devils in details. Um, and looking through those details, again, for, for the IEGU, um, some of the things were the most important under these agreements were having the flexibility to be then reactive, recognizing that this, uh, how this system would evolve would be, um, as much as we've tried to define it, fairly speculative and would be based on a demand growth um, that, though, uh, again, a lot of work had gone into trying to characterize it, it really would, would be proven in the real world as we made gas more available at a certain price, and we saw how the market reacted to try to, again, minimize flexibility, maximize durability of the agreements uh, because of the beneficial things in there, but it's only as good as it is durable and workable in the real world. So it started as far as the public process. Again, we public meetings twice a month. Our board meetings are wide open. Um, although we do have executive sessions, again, we try, you know, everything gets covered in open session before it can go into executive session. We do our presentations before our municipal bodies, particularly the assembly, for which we do quarterly reporting. Um, and so, again, but uh, that is a dedicated process as the group reached culmination. Uh, we went to the uh, Fairs North Star Borough, the city councils. We also dedicated public information meetings. Meetings um, as the agreements were finally crystallized, uh, both at City Hall as well, uh, Fairbanks City Hall as well as out in North Pole, culminating in a special board meeting and uh, public comment period that was solely dedicated to receiving public comment. And we, we did that on November 30th uh, over at the Fairbanks North Star Borough Assembly Chambers. And then at our decision meetings. The decision meeting for IGU was on December 5th, again in the Assembly Chambers, preceded by public comment period and then robust debate, and then finally an, an ADA board meeting on December 7th. Uh, both bodies uh, approving their executive directors or general manager to, to enter these agreements, which we did on December 13th. So those agreements did get signed on December 13th, and I got to call my mother afterwards uh, a bit discombobulated and say, Mom, I've never done before, and she said, what? And I said, I put my John Hancock on a third of a billion dollar contract. So regarding the uh, contents, uh, the, uh, what's really commanded by these agreements, again, it's the full scope of the project, uh, uh, upgrades to the existing Titan One facility uh, for safety, reliability, uh, as well as uh, uh, mission, uh, more use, as well as installation of a couple of new LNG trains over time as demand grows, <laughs> starting with the 3BCF, uh, co-located with the existing Titan facility. Increases in LNG storage capacity, going from the 350,000 gallon currently in use by FNG up to 5.2, 5.25 million gallons worth of storage. So a rapid increase in the amount of storage. Since uh, release, and certainly in the uh, initial term, enough capacity to really act as replacement for everybody's uh, uh, oil tanks, because really the low demand we have at the at the outset is several months worth of LNG storage capacity for the community. Uh, an LNG storage uh, facility out in the North Pole to serve that disconnected system for core North Pole that was installed in 2015. Uh, three build-out phases, up to three build-out phases, timed by market response. Uh, phase one already, uh, again, installed in 2015, but two more phases going up around uh, north side of North Pole and back road, and the services, meters, conversion program, into dental trucks, trailers. So visual basis, again, what's commanded by the agreement, highest level. Again, this over on the left, you see, a, you know, just a representation of the uh, gas conversion and LNG delivery system into storage. Over at the upper right, uh, you see not only uh, the phases or, or the parts of the project, the details, uh ends of the project that are installed, which would be core Fairbanks and core North Pole, but also phases two, which would be the purple and phase three. A further build out to connect those systems and bring service to uh, the medium density area of the community. By the lower right, you see a heat map of the air quality from the 2013 14 season. You can clearly shown the uh, trapezoid of death uh, over Core North Pole, uh, the worst air quality zone. 
zones are. So you, you can see that with the first installation uh, in 2015 for IGU Phase 1, we did cover the bottom half, making uh, yeah, the infrastructure is in place to make gas available at uh, the lower half of the worst air quality zone. <coughs> with phase two, the next development phase being uh, the other half. Activities. Man, I'm going through this way too fast. Okay. Uh, activity, of course, right at the top, you, you've signed these agreements, um, but the process to move through between signature and financial close, that moment when you actually change hands and change of control or ownership takes place. And so uh, IGU and ADA and the Pentex are working diligently to move through that process, uh, particularly regarding conditions precedent that are built within the context, but also some of the uh, uh, more defined activities like the change of control uh, with RCA for ownership. That has been filed with the RCA, as well as change of control, uh, a letter requesting change of control for the North Slope pad. If you recall, uh, the initial configuration of the project was based on the North Slope with an LNG facility there. A, uh, some lease or some acreage was leased from the state, uh, favorably located within the uh, uh, transmission system for natural gas on the North Slope. Uh, it was graveled to the tune of, I believe, the expenditure of the North Slope was, was over $10 million, almost $12 million. Resident that that effort. <laughs> And the asset was uh, uh, on the IEP and, and with IEP funds. Uh, rather than have those assets remain with ADA, we have uh, included in the agreement the transfer of control of that pad. Ask a question. Sure. <coughs> Will that facilitate the effect in any way uh, the project that is paralleling your project, which is the large pipeline? Uh, sh no, it won't have any negative impacts, certainly. Um, how it might dovetail with that larger project is, is unclear. We have, again, we have uh, a really good sized plot of land favorably located with gravel on it. Aid in negotiations right now to sublease a portion of the pad. Uh, I believe, well, I don't want to say what the purpose, what the use is. But, uh, for uh, essentially a facility that's going to aid in the uh, oil and gas production should lease be effectuated, um, because it is a lease acreage on North Slope, is a cost for maintaining the lease. You have lease payments to the state. This checks a number of boxes. It, it brings in revenue in, in excess of those lease payments, so it doesn't off a little cash. It also secures the lease acreage. You know, um, for, for time, the state was kind of liberal running use of land uh, on the North Slope. They tightened up uh, several years ago use it or lose it, essentially, use it or lose it. So it's the use it box. Uh, the, I believe that the pad would at some risk of going, of reverting back to the state for release. schedules, you know, to, to make sure no further issues that need to be addressed. They are the getting them addressed. And work to satisfy the conditions proceeding within the PSA and FA. Questions? Oh, you guys are easy this morning. Do we, do we know when the RCA will have the due diligence? Um, RCA does a different kind of process. I don't, I don't know exactly what you mean by RCA's due diligence. Yeah, that's uh, well, whatever is public, of course, will be made public. 
public if they request it. I, I will be honest with you. This is my first change of ownership, or excuse me, change of control process moving through the RCA, and so I'm not 100% clear of what the process is. Our attorneys uh, over at Brenna and Clarkson are our lead attorneys uh, in coordination, uh, both for the RCA and the disclosure schedules. So I can find that out. Thank you. So, okay. Yeah, so you mentioned the Type 2 and 3 were construction or waiting uh, uh, demand. You know, so for Type 2, isn't the demand already there? Isn't Type 2 construction proceeding without additional demand required? Yes. And it, well, there's a, a some slides on the scope of work. I was referring really to uh, Type 3. Right, I agree with that. Okay. Type 2 and 3 oh, okay. for pending increase in demand. For the, isn't there for Type Already. So, so can you just um, remind me the book that the the original owner of the pad? Ada. Pad Bill? Yes. A less or as project. As part of the pro project. Jack? The pad was built uh, by Ada. Um, in anticipation of that being the location, I believe, the Correct. location for the gas conditioning plant when we were thinking about bringing gas down from the school. So uh, Ada was essentially uh, stuck with it, basically, when, when that plan. So. So, <coughs> storage tank, which is really <coughs> under construction today. Uh, construction has commenced. Uh, it's always nice to be able to let people know that this is not just a paper project. We're actually building things. Now, people, again, people remember that we, uh, both FNG and GU installed distribution piping, but the storage is uh, to feed, to help feed that piping has commenced the construction. And so the storage tank, again, it's 5.2 million gallon capacity. Uh, the uh, structure of it uh, is actually a double containment, double double containment configuration, as opposed to the single wall or excuse me, single containment uh, structure that had originally been uh, proposed for completion in fall 2019. Uh, to jumpstart the process, to not miss another build season, back in June, <clears throat> in expectation of all this coming together. It did appropriate, authorize and appropriate $1.5 million of, of the grant funds, uh, which weren't uh, restricted by HB 105 to, uh, again, re-jumpstart the front engineering and design process for the storage, which they do, uh, Pentex did do. They then went out, uh, once HB 105 plan had been certified, H remember HB 105 plan had been waiting on a gas contract to define the gas cost to uh, be completed. What happened, a uh, plan was certified by resolution by ADA, and the dollars were allowed to flow. Uh, they went ahead and um, authorized a revision of Pentex's existing that's loan. They upped the loan amount so that they could move forward with an RP process and construction. They did so. Uh, they went out over the August, yeah, August to October time frame. They solicited for an EPC contractor, engineering procurement contractor. Limited to companies with a uh, direct previous experience designing and constructing cryogenic LNG storage tanks. They did retain one in December. Uh, and it is actually preload cryogenics. You can see that along the bottom of the outfit off of the East Coast. And you can look up online, by the way, I did. I Googled them. Rogan Texas development team, of course, Dan Britton, Pentex and CEO, is the principal. Uh, the owner's engineer is Chai Engineering, uh, has long experience with LNG. Uh, both LNG production and LNG storage and other things related to LNG. Uh, and, of course, Mr. David Prusak, uh, my project engineer, serving as project manager for the bridge tank construction. So we have a good team at the top. And regarding cryo, or excuse me, uh, preload cryogenics, uh, it is possible, uh, as you would hope, a uh, Pentex team has been uh, trying to bring in and ensure that the subs uh, that, that preload uses are Alaskan or local. You see right at the top, Great Northwest is doing the site prep, uh, initial clearing, excavation, construction of the pad, tank foundation prep. Uh, see Anchor 
Desert Sandy Grohl, Arctic Foundations, Diamond Fencing. Again, this is possible and practicable uh, development team, construction team that is uh, locally based or Alaska based. So, Change Engineering is ITU's engineers. Use Chai also. They're the ones who did our due diligence regarding the LNG facility and the storage facilities. Right. In this case, um, for the, in relation to the tank, it's owner's engineer. Who's the owner? Thanks. We're a weird spot. Again, we've we've signed a contract to, to sign an earnest money agreement. Okay. Uh, moving through the process to, to close, you know, to, to use a residential real estate analogy. Um, but we are still in that kind of funky zone where Pentex is still owned by ADA. Pentex is, you know, still wrecks some of this stuff. Now, in the transition, once we close, the IGU board, the ADA board, and will all be under our ownership and control. But again, right now, we're in that kind of, that kind of middle zone. Um, one thing I want to point out is that uh, Pentex is the door. Sand and gravel on there. There's there being sand and gravel. And gravel. But the question is, are they a local operator or are they out of Anchorage? North Star? No, oh, it's Anchorage. Anchorage sand and gravel. Track. Very big. The difference is that Anchorage sand and gravel uh, makes precast panels. Fairbank sand and gravel does not make precast panels. I don't know that there's anybody in Fairbanks that now makes precast panels. There was at one time. I don't know that they are still doing that. Okay. Got any questions, Dan? Okay. All right, Joel. Okay. Information regarding the tank itself? Um, just a yes or no, probably, whether or not we received an engineer report on the cost of mitigating the ground underneath, like an annual cost. Regarding operations, I did pass that on to the chair. Okay. And well, Dan, she asked some questions. Dan responded. I just hadn't heard any follow-up. Operating costs associated with uh, with the tank are going to include, like, uh, on an annual basis for what you can anticipate costing it. It's all been worked into the model. So there's been an operating cost associated with that aspect. Of the, which back for the, for the facility for that LNG tank. Absolutely. My thinking on that was keeping rates low. So, uh, two things. Uh, we do have a board meeting this evening. Um, the IGU starts at 4 p.m. over at the Key Bank building on the fifth floor. That's where offices are. In fact, we will be receiving a uh, an LNG storage tank update. Uh, the board will. Uh, that might be a good opportunity if any members of the public want more detailed information regarding the tank and, and the status of its construction. Um, you could just go ahead and come on down. In some terms regarding the tank, okay, so as far as the difference between single wall and double wall. Time, uh, Dan had actually gone out, excuse me, uh, uh, Mr. Britton, the pen had actually gone to bid on this LNG storage tank a couple of times in the past. At the time, single containment with burn. Well, a less expensive option. It was totally suitable and a less expensive option. However, when they went out for bids this last time, there was rough rough parity between a double wall construction and a single wall construction. The difference between effectively the difference between double wall and single wall, they're both double walled. But on double containment units, both walls, both of the steel walls of the tank are suitable to hold and contain LNG. The quality of the steel is such that it can withstand those super low temperatures without getting brittle. And a single containment unit where the internal tank is the reinforced one, but the external tank is really just for essentially holding an insulation. If it were punctured, the LNG would roll out, and that's why you needed the berming. And the single containment unit is supposed to, or double containment unit is supposed to hold it in, without all that berming. Second, regarding the LNG tank itself and, and the uh, the engineering for, for the how it's being built, really what's happening under 
beneath the energy storage tank is you're trying to create a, create a controlled environment where it is cold enough to make sure that the permafrost underneath doesn't thaw and thereby become unstable ground, but warm enough, ironically enough, that uh, the extreme cold of the LNG tank doesn't create such extreme cold beneath itself to uh, make wicking. If it's too cold, it'll be wick in moisture and create ice lensing. So a really design that's being uh, put forward and what they're operating under creates a controlled environment that keeps in a, a stable bandwidth of temperatures where, again, it's not so cold that it creates the wicking and ice cleansing that makes it unstable, just it up, but not so warm that it would allow the permafrost to thaw and thereby you know, become unstable. Any difference in sublimation between double and single wall? David, any difference in sublimation between single and double wall? Put back the cost. Uh, the, uh, which affects the cost for the uh, for this both both of these uh, aspects of, of for LG tanks uh, work. Uh, really, uh, the benefit in this is that we take a, a smaller uh, area of land mass to be able to construct the tank. You don't have to have that uh, large exterior tank to be able to uh, have. So you even have to both on the maintenance side and keeping it clear of snow. Well, that, that didn't answer the question of the sublimation of the LNG in the tank. If you double, if you have a wall, are you, you need more stable with a double wall where it doesn't sublime so much where you don't have to have anything in this type of thing? Well, the people that manufacture single wall will tell you that their system is better. People that manufacture double wall will tell you that they have a better system. Both effective. It's in the long run, it's typically more expensive to have a uh, it's more expensive for a double wall tank. In this case, it was a very, very competitive process. So of that aspect of it, it uh, there isn't a difference in cost. Okay. Thanks, Dave. Anything else? Okay, sir. And again, it's under construction. It's moving forward. Uh, target date of fall of 2019, you owe this time to have this conversation. We really are talking about with the project now at a, con a convergence point in fall of winter, fall winter of 2019. Prior on that was the uh, LNG reimbursement that was on and is on offer by the state. Um, just like you had SINGSA, uh, they implemented a, a natural gas uh, storage reimbursement, tax credit reimbursement, um, said up to, was it, it was percent of the cost of a natural gas storage project up to fifteen million dollars. Uh, to year of that, they had done one, have done one for LG. Again, it's fifty percent of a, of the city's construction costs up to fifteen million dollars. Uh, it has to be in operation by January one of twenty twenty. And so we're to get this and in fact we're on target, uh, certainly we're on timeline now to have this large storage tank Constructed and in operation by uh, again fall winter of 2020. So well, where's it being constructed? It's uh, south of Van Horn, off of Pegger. Existing LNG storages. Does everyone know where the pipeline training center is? Their uh, their actual field training center uh, down on South Pegger. It's you know down from that. A, a large facility in, in which the tank is being directed. Correct. That's where that's where FNG tanks. Are. These existing tanks are large. The large they have two. Um, the of the two is down on Tree Road, and that's where this is. For a convergence point of 2020, um, for this inner system, it's a balancing act again. And if if you have overcapacity, well, anytime you construct something, you have to watch out for bottlenecking. Um, build LNG facility, the now bottleneck is storage because you have all this extra LNG production capacity but nowhere to put it. Um, build storage, well, now your bottleneck is LNG production capacity. You have this giant thermos tank that can hold LNG, but you only have a small production facility. So the next step will be building that production facility. Fox distribution piping. You can have a huge LNG facility and huge storage, but if you don't have the pipes to move it around, what is it? So you're finding that, optimiza that optimization point between these three major components 
is what we're trying to make on the conversions point. So stores on track for uh, winter fall of 2019 <laughs> will be the LNG facility having up and constructed by fall winter of 2019. So that the Simmons is ready to accept new customers in say spring of 2020 residential customers. For the 250k storage in North Pole, is that also being constructed at the same time? I'm actually talking to uh, me and Mr. Prusak. We've been having long conversations with GVA, but it's time to kind of, you know, take make things in earnest. Uh, I'm assured that if we can, if we work with FNG, or excuse me, with GVA, because that's that's where we want to cite this thing, we can have that that up and running by 2020. Also, the way we're planning to move forward on the North Pole storage, again, FNG has existing LNG storage. Tanks they have a dollar value associated with them. They will be preceded a 5.25 million gallon tank. You won't need those small bullet tanks there anymore. Our idea is to take the larger, newer two of those, they're about 75,000 gallons a piece, put in the best of the plant in North Pole. When, the storage, when this large storage is up and running, We'll move two tanks over to North Pole, plug them in, and that system will be ready to, to be operational. Then and the crew again a small savings <coughs> for the project by not having to buy new tanks. Or, and and like the are you going to high pressure metal, you know, the transport line from town to be able to get to North Pole? Discussed, um, and it's it's on the uh, I don't want to quite like this, but it's on the wish list. Um, the for that transmission line was somewhere in the $15 million range, but not. it's one of those items that's really good for system optimization and regularization, but doesn't have a, a payback to it. Right. It's an outlay. And a route. So, so in drawing boards, you know, if at a future date, it, pro it will be installed. It stands now, it's not one of those items that's... Uh, Countenanced to be early in the process. They will process to take it over to North Pole. Okay. We are up some ways if funding is available. Um, utilize the Badger Road portion in that way. But again, now as far as there, there's always an idea of a high pressure transmission line yeah. to really make a, 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 a really shove of gas to and fro across the system. Um, it's on the drawing board phase, for waiting for for funding. But it's not mandatory, apparently. It's not mandatory. It's and it's not part of the uh, the project scope. The, it's it's costing. It is not built into the numbers underpinning this. Can you put some context in the um, capacity? Like how much, how many gallons is, is, are the existing customer base using? What does 5.2 million gallons mean? Yeah, it's wow. I wish Dan was online. Um. Like, yeah, or how? He's phone call. Yeah. What we what we know is that for the 1,100 customers, at, I believe at max demand, FNG was moving about 850 million cubic feet, almost almost not quite a billion cubic feet in their system. For that, 30,000 gallons of storage was suspended factory to meet the RCA requirement for five days of liquid storage for firm customer base. That didn't answer your question. No. Sure, did it's okay. 350,000 divided by seven for five. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Oh. 70,000. Okay. Customers. Okay. And some of them. I'm asking how many gallons of uh, kind of the cheek demand, how many gallons. Actually, what I'm wondering is, like, what is 5.2 million? Gallons mean like how, um, like how well, gallons. It's not. It's not. Um, it's, you know, it's, uh, basically, um, from a from a from a store capacity size. Like gallons are burned in a year's time. For in an annual basis. For 100 customers. Uh, on a gallon basis, I've got it. Yeah. I just I don't. I don't think along those lines. It's usually an MCF. So how many? How, how much is each individual? Uh, need to have to be able to have the equations. But I've got them. So but, but it's like five months of storage for 
Okay, Matt. Existing we can do the math. Wait, wait, wait. Well, yeah. Yeah. wait, wait yeah. Yeah. Let's get Jack. Yeah. I, I think the correct answer, Amy, is 70,000 gallons a day at peak demand. Yeah. Okay. Current. Joe Moore, are you going to talk about, so we're talking about 1,100 customers today. Are you going to talk about when the They're burning 25 IU gets now. operational, expanding into the, the existing build-out that is not supplied by gas today? So, I mean, the, the 5.2 million is not designed to provide storage just to the existing customers. It's designed to, to accommodate the build-out. The build out. Yeah. So, can I approach that question and just one play with Please. What's the increase factor then? Compared to what your, your current storage and serviceability is, what's the increase factor? Well, what we know is there are about 9,000 structures with pipe in front of them now. And this LNG, and with their cumulative demand, this 5.25 million gallons will still meet the threshold for five so worth of storage. 9,000. Yeah. The version back to the paying that back is we anticipate uh, creating revenues from about 50% of that. It's a 50% conversion rate. It uh, provides us a storage of about something, if, if we just look at the existing customers that were anticipated, not something like Wainwright <coughs> or Allison Air Force Base that were not part of it. If you're looking at something in excess of 10 days, something less than 15 days of storage capacity in the tank with just that component. Okay. Thank you. Is there a mud in <laughs> So, Joe, I'm gonna, at some point I'm going to build a cubic foot and bring it so we can talk about a million cubic feet as a linear measurement, it's volumetric. But when we talk about gallons, we hold up the mouth jug. And this, you know, is a liquid, um, it could be an air or liquid volume, but it's a little different between one and another. Okay. Okay. Other okay. things happening right now, and this is something for which this group could uh, actively participate as in a letter. Right there are a couple of bills moving through the legislative process, both focused on extension of the bonding authority. Uh, for this project. When the original funding came down, if you recall, it was $57.5 million in grants, $125 million worth of SETS loans, and $150 million worth of bonding authority for ADA, uh, with revenue bonding authority. In five years, it'll be five years, uh, June of this year, that that'll have been on book. Generally, that's when the uh, or you know, sunset. They usually have a five-year sunset. So we're approaching that five-year sunset date on the bonding authority. Both uh, Senate and President Kelly, it's in fact, is one personal bill, um, and Representative Steve Thompson both have bills to just a simple extension of that bonding authority from uh, June 30th of 2018 to June 30th of uh, 2023. Uh, Senate Bill 125, I actually got to testify on it last week. Um, uh, it was heard for the first time in CNRA a week before last on Thursday. It was heard again last Tuesday. Did move from the CNRA, that's the Community Regional Affairs Committee in the Senate, uh, Senator Bishop's Committee. And so that moved through the process. It's next uh, hearing, uh, committee referral, rather, is uh, the Senate Finance Committee. It's not scheduled yet. Uh, it has moved that committee. It has Bill 261. Um, it's awaiting its first hearing. In legislative, excuse me, I think it's House Late Commerce Committee. Either way, though, I did write a letter. Uh, I believe Jim, uh, FEDC, did write a letter in support. So if anyone else would like to write letters of support, please do. Uh, you can forward them to either Senate President Kelly or uh, Representative Thompson. I would do both. Uh, and then prepared, I'll always be letting uh, Hannah know uh, if there's a hearing coming up. And if you'd like to testify in favor, please do so. We'll see if we can't move this to the process. Um, what phase does the House bill have? That for Commerce and House Finance. But does not have a state of regional. Yeah, uh, you know how the bodies are. They, they do things with discretion. 
So again, the, uh, the House bill got labor and commerce and finance. The Senate bill got uh, CNRA and finance. And, um, so typically, five-year authorization for these types of things. So it isn't. It wasn't like a drafting error that this occurred. It's just that five years goes fast in life. Uh, here we are with five years. Um, so remind me then, sorts of funds, the bonds are not. You're not using bond funds for the storage, so not an issue there. Not an issue for the um, uh, down in Kiski. Is that correct? Correct. Okay, so um, you're using bond funds for that. I guess so. Just kind of touch sure. source of funds for a moment. Maybe they're on it. You can not. come back to this. It's it's in the big Kahuna Huna presentation. Okay. Sure. Kiski, right there. It's not ironically one of those people who knows the project intimately. Just saying. Not as significant. The fact that it's a Senate President Bill makes it, you know, oh, there we a go. big target. <laughs> Here you have a rough break of costs, capital costs, yeah. for everything we're talking about. Right now, there's about $42 million worth of grant funds remaining. There's $70 million worth of SETS funds undeployed. That's about $100 million worth of the sweet, sweet money. Again, the grants and the uh, SETS loans that are, are what, fit of deferral, no principal accruing, or so no principal earnest payments, no interest accruing, freeze of money for 15 years, and uh, thereafter, um, the potential for a demand based deferral. We have interest-only payments for five years, and then followed by a payback period at 0.25% interest of either 30 or 35 years. Um, and there's the bond. However, you've got a LNG storage facility now that's uh, what 48 million dollars. Mm -hmm. You have the purse of Pentex, which is 59, <clears throat> almost 60 million dollars. So that only leaves. Um, a couple of million bucks left over of the SETS funds. Okay. So LNG facility, it will wire, as, well, if it is constructed to project scope, which a 3BCF facility costing somewhere between 46 and $50 million, it will require 30 to $40 million worth of bonding to be constructed. Okay. I think that McKissie, I'm Point McKissie, one, one of those places on the water. Um, so timing-wise, you're not as jammed in just because uh, your your schedules for Point McKenzie construction um, you're not letting those contracts currently. Not you're yet. still a little ways out. So. A little ways out. So construction timeline, so the, uh, the storage, the big storage is about two, two years. A uh, uh, construction timeline on the LNG facility is about 18 months. So we're in that six month window. Okay. Um, on what we're going to move forward on as far as uh, liquefaction capacity. Uh, plan A, really what, what is represented by the utility agreements, utility integration agreements, uh, subsumed in that scope of work is Plan A, scope schedule budget for Plan A. Um, third, you know, it's been old vetted. Um, we have lots of financial or economic modeling regarding it. Um, plan A. What comes next or what comes now, it's actually happening right now, is you, you work to build a better mousetrap. You have a workable plan, a, but how could we make it better? Better, cheaper, faster, more reliable, such metrics. And of course, we're still moving through that process and continue to do so on a regular basis. This, uh, this big presentation will be available on FEDC's website. Um, we'll touch on this because we do have a minute. You just kind of touched on it. In the run decision regarding whether or not we would enter into these agreements, of course, again, a huge amount of work had gone into defining a range of things, project scope, trying to find a project scope that was optimized. Again, that, that right balance between LNG production capacity, LNG storage, and potential market base through uh, infrastructure development and distribution um, to, to try to make that market base where you recognize that because of price structure we're going to be operating on, we're going to 
about a you know uh, an estimated 100% conversion rate. We're talking about something less, uh, depending on the price. You know, again, under the Cardano sensitivity analysis, a 50% conversion rate um, with the price of gas. Based under the Hill Corp contract, uh, somewhere that more in the 35% conversion rate. Um, to see if that would be workable under these scenarios. And so we did three major scenario runs for the board. Uh, the first was a base case where we took as, as we did based on as close as possible the true full on the ground information we had and estimates. So the you know the best case or our, our best estimate regarding liquefaction, our best estimate regarding storage. Uh, best estimate regarding distribution costs at gas. Um, did a <coughs> low gas case. I think it's important to point out right now when we're talking about cat pack based case and your in your reference to thirty five percent conversion. The base case model is based on thirty only thirty five percent conversion, not fifty percent. Thirty percent. Thirty five percent. And that's and that's not and that's not in the next couple of years. That's 35% conversion over, forget what it is, like 10 years. Such a 10 year time frame. So the base scenario, which proved, which was the scenario on which we based our connections, indicated that we were successful with 35% conversion in 10 years. Correct. Also, did some bookends. Uh, first was a low gas case. What would the world look like if, if that base price of gas, instead of being uh, seven seventy two, was a dollar seventy two less, a six dollar price, and that having an uh, appreciable impact on the uh, price of delivered gas to city gate meter? But then when we did a stress test, which was a worst case scenario, and that worst case scenario was you, you've deployed the funds to build liquefaction, uh, you've deployed the funds to do storage, but no comes to the party. To be supported solely on the amount of sales FNG currently has right now, which was or which is roughly uh, 1,087 customers <clears throat> and 750 million cubic feet of sales per annum, just to see what that would look like. That's the uh, a slide that just gives a high-level read on those parameters. Again, the uh, gas price. Uh, for, for the base, it was that 772, but then escalated at 2% thereafter, as if you transition that to a longer term contract with an escalator. No growth base, uh, same thing as far as the gas price. Um, and then as far as the low gas pr uh, scenario, again, that's $6. Three years of the Hill Corp contract, followed by a $6 contract, then, or $6 uh, per MCF contract, then escalating to 2%. And then market reaction. Again, uh, customer conversions under the base case, a 35% conversion rate for residential customers, but a 70% conversion rate for commercial actors. Under the no growth, it means no growth. So that's why you have the 0% increase as far as customer conversions. Uh, but then under the low gas price uh, scenario, a 50% conversion rate for residential customers and a 100% conversion rate for commercial actors, because commercial actors act a bit differently than residential. Can I interrupt one more thing? Your conversion rates? Now, look at the conversion rates, 35% uh, residential and 70% commercial or non-residential. 70% residential is not out of line because under current, under, um, under FNG's current operation, commercial customers amount to, uh, to some time uh, the consumption of residential customers. So customers are much more likely to convert uh, than residential customers just in past history. And little evidence supports that. I mean, even right now, uh, FNG and A stories of commercial actors who are coming to them right now, uh, have been, even over the course of the last several years when the oil price was much.
how many, uh, for example, cuts are let outside the city, you know, for, for certain types of things, including supplies. Like during the pipeline, half the stuff didn't come from Fairbanks and commercial customers. It came from Anchorage or somewhere else. So it becomes a foul number of commercial customers, not just a percent. And a brief question in probably on Fort Fairbanks. Um, Five or you know, fifteen to twenty. Do you know in the base case it mentions you know that, that you up bankability to progressively though slowly extend service? Do you know whether or not they ended up paying the thirty-five years of payments or thirty years of payments? Base case um, yeah. was was a, yeah it was a thirty-year payback. Okay. After and to take that it assumes triggering of the uh, uh, base deferral. Right, and then that means probably low, low cost gas. Then they were able to do good thirty five years. Yeah, cost gas uh, because you had reached the uh, fifty percent conversion rate threshold. Right. Yeah, you had a thirty five year payback. Thank you. Basic results again under the no growth scenario, as you would expect. Um, it's higher times for the utility. Um, what was interesting um, was that even though dire times, you had a, a utility. That that was in a fairly fragile position and a vulnerable position. It wasn't accruing a lot of cash, and therefore it didn't have the resources if, if some shock came along. However, um, expected market reaction meant that your utility that wouldn't go bankrupt for at least 20 years, while it had the, def uh, the, the full deferral of set payments and the uh, demand-based deferral, the utility would be survivable. It wouldn't get corrupt, which was saying um, I, I fully expected under the no growth scenario, having made those large deployments, um, it, it, it just wouldn't work. But it worked. I have a couple of questions, Patrice. Um, outside of um, demand growth, if we just talk about the gas supply contract we've had now, could you talk about um, how that contract came about and um, any hope we have for? Perhaps it might be better, or why we ended up with Hill Corp. Three years ago, we had Hill Corp at 21, and everyone said no way. Now we're at Hill Corp at 20.8 or 20.5, and that's somehow all we could get. Sure. For years, everybody, you know, with uh, Pentex and IGU, we, we, every tree in the inlet, we, we literally turned every stone and every clam bed looking for less expensive gas. Probably we ended up running up against a uh, deadline. You know, excuse me, FNG's existing contract for gas was set to lapse this year, um, usually a, you know, a, at least a year in advance to make sure you have gas for your existing customers. You will go out into the marketplace and you will find a contract because you're obligated to serve. Um, so one of the things was spring of last year, um, uh, that cheaper contract not having been nailed down, we bifurcated the market. We allowed, we told FG, go ahead and do the best you can in the negotiation with Hillcorp. IG will take the rest of the inlet and see what we can find. Um, being successful, we did the parameters on, on uh, Pentex in their search for gas negotiating with Hillcorp. IG asked for a couple of things. One of those we asked for was try to limit the exposure. We just assumed that a Hillcorp contract would involve Hillcorp pricing for gas. And if that's going to happen, again, Hillcorp is very secure. They're a good company. They have gas behind pipe. You can put them today, and they will meet obligations, but you have a price premium for it. Fine. There's going to be a price premium for that security. Let's try to limit the exposure to years. If it's going to take two to three years to build an LNG facility, build storage, see if we limit that contract to two or three years. And all that infrastructure, when the IEP proper is ready to go, we, we at least the hope of superseding this contract with a better one. We're able to achieve that. Some of the things that we're able to achieve that we didn't expect, but we're just happy for. It's like there's no take or pay requirement. You have enough gas to meet existing customer base, but also north, uh, north side, upside potential as far as volume of gas should we need it for expansion in this three-year time frame. That got built in. There are price escalators built into this contract. Your standard Hillcorp contract, the one that F&G just had, 
um, had built-in inflationary escalator. I want to say it was 4% per annum. This contract has no escalator. And so for three years, it is a fixed price of gas with, with very little, if any, differentiation between the name of delivery of gas. Again, um, in the market, you have a lot of gas in the summer, <laughs> but you have uh, tight gas in the winter time when demand is high. It will also often be a price differential but uh, based on seasonality. This does not include that. It's just 772 of gas for three years. So it gives that, that platform to work, work from. What we do from, from here and the happening is we're still out in the marketplace trying to find that successing, succession contract of gas that would be the lower price point than the one we have right now. Please, Chancellor, I'll be gas if anyone out looking for that. Uh, yes. That would be a state option, and the governor assured me, Rebo, that he is still um, trying to accomplish that. Doesn't have to look for it there. Right. But, Mark? Um, the uh, growth case, and after 20 years, you could get in trouble. I don't remember since IGU is a creature of the assembly, some people ask, who's that? I mean, suddenly the boroughs, you know, hung out. I don't know how it goes up if they're actually in no, a no. very obscure case that you would get. So IGU, you IGU is a corporation uh, of of the Fairbanks North Star Borough. Right. However, it's an independent mm -hmm. corporation of the Fairbanks North Star Borough. So okay. its debts and obligations are its own. Uh, only ones that uh, the borough may, uh, obligations the borough may have would be the ones that we as a community decide to accept. That would be if the borough, uh, if we wanted bonds and the borough was going to back those bonds and it went to the vote of the people and they said, yes, we'll accept that, that bond exposure. Um, as, again, as it stands now, there's enough of a dip, uh, separation between the inter entities that, uh, you know, the debt <coughs> obligations of IGU or the debts and obligations of IGU. And if we were to go corrupt, it would only be our assets. IGU is not equal to. Do you ask a question? This is Gary Newman. Are you taking Colin? Yeah, Tom, I was wondering if I could ask a question about transportation. Sorry. Uh, a question, we, we talked about uh, what kind of uh, truck we're going to be having or if you have to buy more trucks to fill that 5.2 million gallons or how many trucks a day, that sort of thing. Could you just on that, please? I could ask. Um, yes, the, the, the scope of work does include um, $5 million. Uh, for additional trailers, um, between 10,000 and 13,000 gallons of haul. Uh, ten with five million would be ten, right? A few. Uh, they're current. I believe they have six trailers now. Uh, but actually, their fleet is about. Uh, 14. Oh, so uh, some are, you know, they use some actively, some they don't, but um, we would expect to probably end up with a fleet of about uh, 10 new trailers, which are the 15,000 gallon trailers, not the 10,000 10, gallon trailers. Uh, they have three in hand right now, and you know, short term, depending on uh, driven, uh, short term, I would anticipate that we'd see a four to five purchase in the next. Uh, three years. Is that what happens with Titan 2 or, or other supply coming in? Hey, does that answer your question? Uh, but then basically, how many trucks a day do you figure keep that full? I mean, I could do that, but you guys probably have a better idea. The way it'll work with, for the storage of that will be year round. But right. essentially, we're looking at something on the order of 10 to 12 trucks. I don't yep. see it succeeding 12 trucks a day. Okay. That's what it sounded like. Thanks so much. Okay. And while we're online here, is there anybody else online that has a question? Yes, Ray. I've got a question about gas supply. Sir. Sure. 
and you're still looking for gas, and are you looking in Cook Inlet, or have you opened it up and starting at North Slope yet? Um, just in Cook Inlet. And again, the, the project configuration is transitioned, at least this one, uh, down to a Cook Inlet configuration. So are you headed to building that next plant in Cook Inlet? The base project configuration. Of course, if you were going to build an LNG plant on the North Slope, <laughs> that, that might change the whole thing. An announcement to make? Especially if you can deliver a price at CityGate at, say, $9. All day long, Ray. Just <laughs> okay, that, that's, actually, that's actually an interesting concept you bring up as a competitive. First, well, well, and <laughs> okay. Put some so free next money. Put free and other projects, and you'd see what would develop. There you go. Okay. Okay. So regarding next steps, uh, particularly in the immediate term. So again, we're we're moving the PSA and FA toward financial close. Uh, we're we'll continue to do so. We do have a natural gas conversion program uh, we've been working on, um, and we're we're advancing it. I actually have my latest update. It's completed. It's October of last year. Just been waiting for us at that moment. Uh, well, first to see if we would move forward on the PSA FA, where it might be something we would use as a utility directly. Otherwise, it would be handed to ADA for advancement. Um, but it's scheduled to be brought before the board on February 20th. It really focused. I asked my team last year, and I that uh, we had managed to negotiate in about three million dollars of programmatic funding for a conversion program uh, into the scope of work. Uh, it's not enough to really be offering what I know people really would like, which is grants, uh, but it is enough to support a program. Uh, so I asked my team to go ahead and focus on potential offerings that a utility like ours, which is to say one with limited funding, could offer or does offer directly uh, to its potential customers. Um, again, with limited funding, what, what we've strong on is an uh, on-bill repayment program. Uh, as a cornerstone of a, a, a robust customer onboarding assistance program. It stands now, it's really mostly convenience-based. On payment is you as a customer, you want to do a conversion, you go to your private lender, you get that loan. Uh, but instead of having to write two checks, one to your natural gas utility and one to your bank, you could write one check to your natural gas utility. The bill would include of, for repayment of your conversion, and we would send a check over to uh, Wells Fargo or Bank of America, whomever you use as your lender. It's mostly a convenience factor. But there's work happening as well, uh, trying to find additional funding, and that has not stopped. Uh, I know that the borough has been working with the feds to try to amend the targeted airshed grant money that's currently being used for a uh, Woodstock change-up program to be able to go not only from solid fuel to the cleaner solid fuel burning, but from solid fuel to some other fuel. And I believe, well, we're still, they're still awaiting word back from the feds as to whether or not that's going to be allowed. Uh, but if it is allowed, it'll be uh, the year's $4 million worth of funding would be allowable for that purpose, and hopefully we'd be able to do, use some of those funds moving forward. I hope Steve Brown, Region 10, can up and address the IGU board. So we'll get our questions ready to talk with him on a regular basis. And this is the EPA? Yes. Oh, oh okay. So, again, uh, right now we have a report. It'll be brought before the board on February 20th, and it'll be available to the public, and we'll, we'll send it to Hannah. For the utility integration plan and its implementation, that plan has been at about the 90% also since last year. Been waiting uh, for that opportunity before the board. The opportunity is coming, and so on March 6th we'll be uh, receiving a presentation regarding the potential utility integration plan. Um, there'll be some choices to be made by the board. They'll get to make them, and once they make them, then we'll move forward on implementation of that plan. Uh, so, but again, that'll be March 6th board meeting. We are working on a procurement manual. Uh, that is also at, at a 90 plus percent uh, completion. Uh, we're, we're moving forward. Uh, well, we're trying to finalize that, and then we'll bring that before the board for certification. We already have a procurement policy, but this will give us the guidelines on. Your procurement 
as well as policies that were mandated by the and desire uh, within the PSA and FSA. And then finally, as you can see, we're, of course, we're still moving Huckley Buck forward. I love using that phrase, but thank you for giving it to me. Uh, the North Pole LNG storage facility, as well as the uh, Trier Road LNG storage facility. But the bottom, again, I like to leave that note. Really, the sense of analysis towards system optimization. Again, we have a plan A. It has been worked on for years. It has been solidly vetted. But that doesn't mean you put the blinders on. You're always looking for ways to make it better, cheaper, faster, more secure, do your metrics and see if you can improve. And so we keep we keep moving forward on that. We have received a couple of unsolicited proposals over the course of the last year that are a bit of a modification upon Plan A. Um, one is an alternative fuel, one that uses an alternative uh, or a different kind of development, uh, moving forward on a more incremental basis. Uh, <coughs> But again, we're going to keep vetting those. And obviously, Ray, then that that opens the door for you also. Again, have a good plan A, but make it better. And if you have a way or, or think you have a way, an idea about how we can make it better, we're about to open up that uh, LNG development process, except to be able to review those kinds of proposals. Oh, thank you, John. Uh, if anybody's interested, there's some links there. Wanted to make sure I provided those. Uh, if you want more information, there's a wealth of it, both on the IGU and the ADA websites. You can also Google IEP Alaska or IEP ADA, and that's a dedicated ADA IEP website. Huge amount of information there. Ruth Fairbairn's Natural Gas, there's their website. And then finally, regarding the state legislature. And if you want to track for yourself any one of these bills or other bills, their site is there also. Okay. Other questions? Pardon? Oh, sorry. Thank you, Joe. Oh, Mark. Sorry. Uh, yeah, a useful, interesting question. If uh, we more asked, when can they add new customers to FNG? Because it is out in front of people. FNG could actually add, my understanding is FNG could actually add new interruptible customers now. In, okay, in 2018. Right now. Um, again, interruptible customers depending on volume. Right. Uh, when we'll be in a position to start adding those uh, firm customers, yeah. is what you're talking about. Yeah. If the LNG facility prosecution is that there's additional LNG capacity, that allow a couple more. Otherwise, it'll, again, it'll be in that fall, winter 2020 time frame. Right. It'll be 2019. Time frame when you have all the infrastructure in place, we have most residential customers. Let's try this another way. We don't expect that we'll get too many residential customers wishing to convert in the winter of 2020, 2019, 2020. So we expect that uh, residential demand will start to uh, show itself in spring, summer of 2020. Right. For obvious reasons, again, you you know shutting your your furnace at 20 below, or should be 40 below. Transitioning. To transition is, yes, yeah, maybe some dicey business. It'd probably be expensive to keep it, the house warm in the process. So we expect residential customers that will, will happen about the 20, during the 20, 20 time frame. So that, um, you're talking additional customers when the storage tank is complete. Is that correct? Correct. Not necessarily when pent tanks We don't have to wait night two to get additional customers. Correct. We can do it uh, when the storage tank is complete. And the reason is, is because uh, we'll have the capacity, since Titan 1 will be operating year-round now at full capacity, because we have a storage tank now at 5.2 million gallons, it actually increases the ability to take on new customers. That is correct. Um, yes, even if you, we do not get a new facility and only were to do even <coughs> actually if we did nothing to the Titan facility. Yes, with a distortion you could boost deliverability by by several sub, several several customers. Um but again now we envision both either uh an upgrade of the Titan facility for increased uh capacity there or again play as, as a, a shiny new three PCF 
capacity. But yes, Jack, you're, you're absolutely correct. With just the additional storage, the system deliverability would, would be improved. It would be able to run Titan all year long. As stands now, with the limited storage, um, epidulates its system by dialing up and dialing down the LNG facility, which is where it certainly harms the efficiency of the, the nameplate on a per annum basis. Uh, the storage, though, will, will not allow you to double the system. Or that would not be 2,200 customers. It would be more like 1,500, 1,600 customers. The number that's popping into my head is that you could increase the deliverability by 50% with adequate storage. Oh, that's pretty much really 1,600. Yeah, 15, yeah. 15, yeah you, you're just so mean to me, man. So <laughs> Throw those numbers around. So, um, it's not really related to any of the operations things or the plans for this IEP. As far as air quality goes, there's going to be a serious overlap between when we're required to clean up our air, whether or not the state is successful in getting an extension, which will be vigorously fought, um, and whether or not, um, you know, how we move forward with air quality. 2020 is too late to meet the goals and of clean air in terms of federal regulation, in terms of health and safety in our community. So I want to make sure that always stays out there, that um, you know, while we have time and do it right, we also have this other issue going on, and we need to keep it front of One thing, though, that, uh, is that uh, the EPA is closely tracking this interior energy project, and, uh, and, and, sit, and they do consider it a step forward by this community. And a cornerstone of, of, of any plan. But they still meet their timelines, and this project doesn't meet the timeline at this point. So there'll be an intersection of that, and we'll just see how it goes. I don't need to underplay it, and so I hope I haven't. Conversions is a big, big deal. Mm -hmm. out how we're going to get and uh, facilitate uptake of gas is a big, big deal because those are what underpin all of this. Uh, um, I did some water bath just yesterday because I had to be on David Cruz's radio show. 50,000 structures. You're going to set up a grant program, not like the Woodstock Chicago program, uh, where, say, you gave $5,000 grants per for those 15,000 conversions. That's $75 million. $5 million. Clearly, we don't have five million dollars for trying to figure out how we could put additional resources in that bucket uh, to help is something that, that we not only have been working on but are going to be working on in greater and greater earnest now that we do have a defined timeline for which we could really use a convert assistance program we have two years to start put you know to, to put the pieces together so that that spring of 2020 is in place to help new new customers and new you know homeowners and businesses convert. Um, and just actually about one more uh, volunteerism or an opportunity for everybody. We are about to reinitiate the uh, conversion assistance or, or the conversions task force, the conversion steering committee. We allowed it to lay dormant the last couple of years because we didn't want folks getting uh, volunteer burnout. And we you know we sure exactly what the timeline was going. For needing a program. Now that we have that definition, um, at the board level, we've actually just established and elected a, uh, a board level chair for a conversion subgroup uh, and to help with the steering committee. And so we'll be reconstituting that. So anyone who has an interest in conversions has ideas about how we can encourage it, that board is going to be reestablished so we can, again, work through those issues to try to have something in place by 2020. Okay. Patrice. I just to, to keep things in perspective, you're correct. Seventy-five million dollars is a lot of money, but over the last five years, um, starting as six years ago, the legislature gave four private wineries and the Agrium Fertilizer Plant at fifty million dollars each, and we even wrote to them and asked them to stop. The legislature had the ability to stop funding that. It was never requested by the companies. So Charles so just bought in this kitchen power plant, or hit the LNG plant for approximately $30 million. But they received $50 million from the state, and they have no requirement to account for that money. They 
they could use it in any way they want. So we talk about cleaning up our air, um, improving health and safety, and treating the citizens of the community like the responsibility of the Constitution of Alaska, not private companies. Five million is really not that much. And so I wonder what the legislature is doing to cough up more money. Um, I know they're short. I know that the budget is really tight, but they've made decisions before. There's a will, there's a way. Okay, Jack. Someone will remind me under the base case scenario that we modeled. Um, I don't believe that that assumed uh, not federal assistance for conversion, did it? It did not. Right. So, our base case scenario: 35% conversions assumed. No Studies for conversion. Okay. So, we do get some consistent conversions, which I believe that we will. It just proves, it just improves our conversion rate. As a matter of perspective and operation, again, we took a very conservative approach regarding base modeling um, so that, you know, things so things could only get better. Um, you know, we didn't factor things like the load, potential loads from the military bases. Um, we didn't, uh, you know, just assume more things coming from anywhere else. Uh, so those simply improve the economics as we go, rather than uh, building a building a rosy picture uh, where the pieces don't, or, or yeah, if the stars don't fully align perfectly, you have shortfall, which is a conservative approach. Okay. We're coming. Good job. And next week we have Nick Sarnecki from the Borough Air Quality Division actually coming. Uh, See you then. Are you ready to